What's up, Rangers Nation? It's Alex Plink with Texas Rangers Fanatic Podcast Episode 9. Uh, and I am joined by a fellow Dallas Sports Fanatic contributor, Mr. Garrett Jones. Garrett, what's going on? Hey, Alex. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm completely flattered to uh, join a long and growing guest list of elite uh, Dallas media coverage. I, that's the first time I've ever been grouped with Sean Bass, CJ Nikowski, those guys. So I am a very, very, I was very flattered by the invitation. That's the good news. The downside is I feel like because you do Dallas Stars coverage and that's repping the little Dallas Stars here today. I, I, I feel okay, like. <laughs> I know. I feel like I'm dragging you, like you've been spending time in an exotic location, and then I'm just dragging you to like the wrong side of town to talk no, about an 11 and 17 team that's thinking about selling at the trade deadline. That's that's too real, honestly. To be honest, like over the past week, like I've watched the stars at a certain point and just said, I can't believe that this is my team. You know what I mean? Like, I can't uh, – we're not, as Dallas sports fans from the past decade, we are really not used to things going our way. So, just seeing the way that they played over the past six games has been such a refreshing uh, – so, so refreshing. And I'm just really impressed. And, um, yeah, you're right. It, the Rangers do humble us. They bring us down to earth. For a while there, it looked like they were, you know, kind of over cheap. But, um, yeah, they definitely, over the past week, have brought us back down to earth. I feel like Ranger fans are saying, I can't believe this is our team, but not in the same context. Right. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> the best of the best of both worlds. And yes, I know I'm quoting Hannah Montana and I don't care about that. So Respect. let's <laughs> a little bull throwback right there. So Respect. um Let's take a look at – well, let's go to a little bit of positive. Uh, this is Tuesday, August 25th, so the Rangers do come out with a victory last night against an Oakland Athletics team that, quite frankly, came into the night 20-9, and nine, tops in the American League. Lance Lynn does Lance Lynn things, but last night's game was interesting because, first of all, the Rangers had a lead for more than two innings, something they hadn't had in a couple of weeks or since their last victory against Colorado on the 15th of August. And they scored early, something that they had only scored seven runs in the first inning all year before yesterday. Right. And they put two on the board. Oakland answered with a run. Isaiah Connor falafa goes deep. So it was – a lot of positives to take out of it. Yeah, still 3-2 win, three runs on the board. Lazardo was tough yesterday. Yeah. But I feel like there was a lot more energy in the clubhouse, more energy on the field. And it just – I think even Chris Woodward said it before the game, there was a lot of positive vibes in the clubhouse. I don't know how long this streak is going to go, if it's a one-game winning streak, but – do you think how promising do you think that is to for a team like Oakland to come in town and pick up a win like they did yesterday? Right. I think the valuable thing was just getting the streak off their back, honestly, just getting that monkey off their chest. Um, because, you know, you look at the schedule and they've got Oakland home this week. They've got the Dodgers coming to town this weekend. There's not a lot of winnable games within that bracket. So for a team that came in having not won a game in a calendar week, that was so important for them to just get that behind them. And I like what you said about Lance Lane because pretty much with the Rangers, coming into the year, we kind of knew this, right? We thought Mike Miner would be in this conversation as well. But, uh, excuse me, anytime you got Lynn on the hill, the Rangers can feel pretty confident about winning the game, right? I mean, they've won all five of his starts, I believe. He's got a 4-0 record, sub-2 ERA. We thought Mike Miner was going to bring something similar to the table. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but he hasn't this year, obviously. Um, it's the question marks between two and five in the rotation uh, that have been the biggest issue for Texas. So just the fact that you had Lynn on the hill last night bode very well, and I think the Rangers got that win right when they needed it. And I think, well, here, here's two things. One, I think it makes Ranger fans feel a little, I know it makes me feel a little better to see San Diego go in and whip Houston over the weekend, knowing that, hey, part of it wasn't just the Rangers struggling. It was the right. fact that the, they caught the Padres when the Padres were ridiculously hot. Second thing is, and Absolutely. I might ask Chris Woodward about this, but 
there is something about this weekend with the Dodgers coming to town. Dave Roberts coming to town. Something about seeing your former guys. I don't know if that's going to add a little bit more motivation. It's unfortunate that Willie's out because I'm mm-hmm. sure that would have been a fun weekend for Willie to be participating. But I don't know if that's going to add a little bit more motivation. And I know if the starts go in order, Lance Lynn's scheduled to go on Saturday against the Dodgers. Again, scheduled to go. Who knows what's going to happen? There could be some eyes put in that other dugout. So. Uh, we'll certainly we're going to talk about the trade deadline, but isn't it weird that the team who's 11 and 17, and I just looked at this a little bit ago, are three and a half games back of a playoff spot? Yes, I know expanded playoffs, but Toronto's a game over 500. Right. You, you, and, you know, it, baseball's a fickle game, right? Because I like what you said about the Padres because. They, they're a playoff team. There's no question about it. They've proven it over the past week. They've got the pitching. I mean, the offense is never a question. They've got the, the, the pitching. They're a playoff team. If Texas somehow hangs on and wins that one game on Thursday that they were in a position to win, this is a whole different story, right? The Padres aren't on an eight-game winning streak. Texas isn't on an eight-game losing streak. The one thing about last week that was really inexcusable was the two blowout losses to Seattle. Uh, Mm -hmm. Under no circumstances should you be taking two blowout losses to Seattle. Uh, And if you really think about it, they win that game on Sunday. They're in a position right with Toronto for a playoff spot. So if they don't let that one get away in the final game of the Padres series and they get any kind of offense going on Sunday, this is a completely different conversation, right? Because then they're sitting right around 500, which is pretty much what they've been the entire calendar season. So, I mean, baseball is weird in that way anyway, but then when you've got a 60-game season, one sour week, and you're done. That's exactly what we've seen with the Rangers. You take away last week, they've been a pretty average team for the most part, but the average is good enough to get you to the playoffs this year. And then you think about it, I mean, you can even look at that Padres series. Tuesday, they lost by two. Wednesday and Thursday, both walk-offs. Where And then you look at, like you said, the Seattle series. I think I talked about this with with Sean last week. And, of course, that changes with the two blowout losses against Seattle. Before those – and I think if you add those five, I believe, I might have that wrong. I would say four or five losses this year have been by five runs or more. Wow. Out of their 17 – that's that's unbelievable, and that's that's just I think that's largely a product of uh, using forty different pitchers already to this point, or what is it, forty roster players and forty pitchers, some uh, abominable stat this, this season. It's, and, and it's unbelievable, and all eleven of their wins have been by four runs or less. Wow, they have not yeah, they, five. They have not blown a team out this year. You know, I would say – I would actually say that stat's kind of encouraging, honestly, because when you do feel the competitive team, the ones that win divisions, right, the ones that clinch wild card spots win close games like that, yeah. right? Yeah. And we've seen the Rangers have some success like that with playoff teams. Uh, so I think that's good for Chris Woodward to be in those situations where he knows that his offense isn't going to push him over the hump and he's got to manage to win the game from the fourth inning on, right? Whenever you push across the go-ahead and run, you've got to manage to keep it there and win the game, especially with all kinds of new strategy at play in 2020. Uh, but I, I agree with you in the fact that for the 2020 Texas Rangers that aren't getting a lot of run production, that are using bullpen arms – uh, wherever they can find them that aren't closing games that are uh, allowing blowout losses. I agree with you that that doesn't bode well right now. Now you do have Kyle Gibson going, who's been a lot better. Who's I think if you're talking about the other four starters who has been the most consistent. Yeah. He gave up a grand yeah. slam to Eric Cosmer, but outside yep. of the grand slam to Hosmer, I think he pitched pretty well his last time out. Okay. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with Jordan Lyles. Uh, it's just way too inconsistent. Mike Miner, despite the uh, losing effort in his outing, I think stuff-wise he looked better, and you're seeing yeah. that improvement. And Colby Allard, I just think in such a way Allard's gotten 
Well, I will say this. He's gotten some bad luck, but also I think his thing is he needs to put away hitters. He got stuck in a lot of 0-2 counts where he couldn't put Seattle Mariners away, and that's why he ended up not getting out of the first inning, which is something that is definitely – it's definitely doable. So I, I, I right. think when you look at the rotation, yeah, it's been it, – on paper it's been abysmal – outside of Lance Lynn, but I think you can trend it into the right direction. Now, Oakland right. offense, Dodgers offense, Astros offense that's coming up, it'll be a big test, and we'll see if uh, if they're up to the challenge. Right, right. Well, I, I'm a big Kyle Gibson fan. He and I share an alma mater of the University of Missouri, MIZ. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of his personally, and it's funny when you mentioned – Pretty much he's been the most consistent outside of Lynn. I remember last week checking out his numbers and seeing going in the start at San Diego, he was below a four ERA. Mm -hmm. I was like, where did that come from? Like, I remember him struggling early in the year. He just very quietly strung together some quality starts. And sure enough, he was there with a four below an ERA. And Eric Hosmer changed that. Now he's putting up some crooked numbers. But I think this is a big start for him tonight. Uh, I think if they could get any kind of quality outing out of him against Oakland, that would put them in a really good position to win. Um, John Heyman was on MLB Network this morning talking about Mike Miner and talking about that he's a good fit for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, I could see that a trade like that materializing for him. I think he could also be a New York Yankee. That's a team looking for pitching. Uh, I doubt the Rangers would listen to offers from Houston uh, just because you don't want to move a talent like that within the division no matter what. Uh, so I, I see even though Houston is absolutely starved for quality arms. So – uh, you know, the rest of the rotation shaping up. I think Colby Howard will get there eventually. Uh, I remember last year we saw him get out to a 3-0 start, even though that wins losses don't always tell the story for pitchers, especially in 2020. Uh, I do think that he has the talent to get there eventually. Uh, and if the Rangers can move Mike Miner for another prospect that's going to yield what Colby Howard brings. Uh, if remember last year they traded Allard. Uh, they got Allard for Chris Martin. Mike Miner should theoretically fetch you a lot more than you can get for Chris Martin. Uh, so I like the chances there. Uh, Jordan Lyles may or may not have been tipping his pitches, as you know, uh, against Seattle. So I think if you can get a quality start to where you're not tipping your pitches, and you can give up less than five runs. I think that you can keep him around to eat up some innings other than that. But yeah, other than that, the, uh, the, the Rangers rotation has been suspect to say the least. See, I kind of on the minor situation kind of disagree with the Houston aspect because you, I say you still listen yeah. and see what are they willing to give up for Mike Minor. Right. And then you right. see. Now, I don't know in, again, Houston's case, how much are you going to give up to a division rival? So right. I think you have to, and, and you know, John Daniel said, we're going to listen. And why wouldn't you? You're going to listen to everybody on that list. Who's available? Everybody's available, I would say. Right. I mean, as far as listening to, now you're not going to jump the gun, but yeah. I mean, if if there's little uh, little rumors spreading around about, let's say Joey Gallo, you know, what are you going to get? What are you what are you willing to give me for someone like Joey Gallo? Here's the thing with the trade deadline coming up because all 30 teams are in financial hardships, mm -hmm. so taking on contracts. I don't, and that could be one thing because Lynn still has another year left on his contract. So are whoever they're going to trade it to, are they going to take over that contract? Will right. the range, I mean, I highly doubt the Rangers going to eat up the rest of that contract unless they get something ridiculous in return. And plus right. you're only going to have, that's why I think a team like the Dodgers or I mean, I don't know if Oakland's interest – I doubt Oakland would, would fall into there, but a team like the Dodgers because you know that you're going to have Lynn for more than a month, whereas if you're a team on the cusp, you may only have Lynn for one more month for this year and then have another year if you're willing to take on that contract. Right. So that could be – and then plus with minor leaguers, you don't get your scouts – you're not able to see minor leaguers you, because there's no minor league baseball. Right. So that's why this is going to be a funky trade deadline uh, coming right. up. I, from my perspective, I don't think there's going to be a lot of major activity. I don't think you'll see blockbuster trades like you would in normal years on July 31st. Um, but 
you may see some small transactions like Daniel Vogelback going to the Toronto Blue Jays for cash considerations because Seattle doesn't get yep. him for assignment. You may see stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, August right. 31st, uh, that day has a lot of things to it. Most importantly, your boy will be 29 and uh, it'll be the one year anniversary of the Rangers retiring oh, Michael Young. Oh man. You see, those, those are good. Those are good things to think about in this crazy world we live in, in this bizarre, wacky Rangers season. Good things to think about. Happy early birthday, by the way. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And if you're the Rangers, I think you approach this trade deadline with the philosophy, hang on to Lance Lynn. I think he's somebody that you hang on to and build the franchise around. Uh, I think you try to work on an extension with him, if anything. Like I said, because pretty much the only time you can feel confident that the Rangers are winning a game in 2020 is when he's on the mound. So I think that he's shown he's got ace stuff. He showed it last year. He almost won the Cy Young for crying out loud. Um, I say extend him, uh, hang on to a player like that. I do think that Mike Miner uh, sell low on him, right? Just get whatever you can get. Hope that you can get a major league ready arm like Colby Howard. Uh, I'd look for a return like that. And you really kind of kick yourself when you think about Mike Miner because last year nobody wanted to move him, right? The, the Rangers listen, but Rangers fans thought, no, no way. You have to hold on to that arm, especially since you got him under contract for 2020. I was so glad that they didn't trade him last year. But I, I don't know what offers they fielded from the Yankees, but just thinking about that there could have been some return for a pitcher who's 0-4 with a 675 ERA uh, in 2020, that kind of that kind of is something that the Rangers are probably going to kick themselves for. So I think you move him for any kind of major league ready talent. I don't think you kind of gamble and see what where prospects are at. Because like you said, Alex, you have no way to evaluate them in 2020. Uh, and then as far as other spare pieces here and there, I'd like to stay, and I would hope that they would hang on to Gallo no matter what. Um, like I said, you, you know, we saw what we got from him last year in the first half. That is an all-star MVP caliber player when he can put it all together. And I hope he gets a chance at a full season within the next couple of years here with the Rangers. And I think he's going to be the next big Rangers star. But everybody else, I think, is movable for sure. Um, Rafael Montero, I think, is a guy that the Rangers should shop aggressively. He's shown that he can pitch really well in high leverage spots. Um, that being said, if the Rangers don't move on from him, I'm really glad that the team has a rock-solid closer. Uh, it's been two years since Jose Leclerc really locked that down that we've seen the Rangers have that guy that they can have at the back of the bullpen. So if the Rangers don't move on from him, I'll be more than okay with it. But I think that he might draw some interest from teams for sure. That's an excellent point because I think you look at Jonathan Hernandez as your future closer. And so right. if you start hearing things about Rafael Montero, maybe you listen. Uh, Though I will say that probably what you're going to, the best cases you're going to get are guys whose contracts are up this year. Um, right. And there's not too many. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, it looks like coming up at the end, you have uh minor uh, Jesse Chavez, who's on the injured list right now. Um, Jeff Mathis, you're not going to get anything from Mathis. Uh, and then Juan Acasio, who's, on leave and Shinsu Chu where if he's not, if he wasn't hurt because he's dealing with a lot of injuries right now, I think maybe you could have gotten something for right. Chu, a good veteran top of the lineup type guy. But since he's been dealing with some aggravating injuries and has been out for pretty much the past week, I think all, all bets are off on that. Um, unless a team is willing to, uh, send something over, but I mean, I, I don't think you're going to get anything for Chu off that, especially right. given his age. And like you said, like I said, as far as injuries go. Right. Yeah. Chu, Chu is a guy who in a normal season, I could definitely see somebody picking up on a waiver trade in like, right, like right now, like in mid August, uh, like, or like the first week before September, uh, just looking to add a guy on a postseason run. I could totally have seen that happening if this were a normal season. Obviously, it's not. 
and the, what would normally be the waiver trade de- trade deadline is the non waiver trade deadline. Uh, so I don't think anybody will buy for him. I think that he will finish his Rangers contract out um, in 2020. And you know, I don't I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. Uh, I, I, that contract will be debated for years. Um, I'm glad that they got an all star appearance out of it. Uh, I think that you could make the argument that over the 2017, 2018 and some of 2019 Rangers that he was the most consistent all around offensive player. Um, So, you know, I'm glad that they at least got something out of that and hopefully he'll be able to just ride off into the sunset with some kind of positive offensive production at the end of his Rangers career. Todd Frazier does have a team option next year. Um, So I know Frazier is another one on that list where I think maybe you could get a little something off of Frazier uh, if teams are willing to listen. I mean, he's had a pretty good season, uh, all things considered. He's shown that he could play third base and first base. He hadn't played much of first base prior to this year anyway. And he's Mm -hmm. been fantastic against left-handed pitching. And he's a great presence in the clubhouse, a good veteran that I'm sure – some team could use something like that. Yeah. Uh, but again, how much are you really going to get from Frazier is right. the question. And right. I think with the Rangers, yeah, some guys you do may need to deal, but you got to be smart about it as well. And that's right. kind of on the basis of what John Daniel says. We're not just going to deal guys to deal guys. Right. We, we want to make sure that we're getting the best value out of these guys. And when, you know, with Lance Lynn, that's, you know, That's it's good. a it's a risk yeah, I, reward. I'm, I'm type glad thing. to hear that from Daniels. Right, right. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of glad to hear that John Daniels is keeping him close to the chest on this. Honestly, I don't think that this is a year that you put too much stock in, no matter how it goes. Right, and baseball is so fickle because, like I said, you know, three of those outcomes changed for the Rangers last week in what was an eight game losing streak, and we're talking about a vibe from the club here with the shot of the playoffs. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't think you put too much stock into what you have this year. I do think, like we talked about, there are a few minor moves that they can make, no pun intended, uh, a few minor moves that, 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 that they could make that would help the team in the long run. But I'm, I'm glad to hear that John Daniels is doing that. He has been the subject of much Twitter criticism over the past couple of weeks. And not, not that you can put too much stock into that anyway, um, but – you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily warranted. Um, I, I think that rebuild for the Rangers, they showed that they kind of got it off the ground last year. And I think this year you just look to take any positives that you can out of it and move on towards next year. But as far as Todd Frazier, um, I didn't want to say, I could totally see a team like the Rays or the Cubs biting on him, right? Uh, not because they necessarily have a hole to fill, but because he is just a great bat, great locker room presence, like I, your article noted yesterday, great piece. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that he responded to you on Twitter, by the way. That's funny. Uh, he, he's just a, he's just that kind of guy, right? He's, he's interactive. He's a positive presence. I think you need that in a, in a season like 2020. So uh, Chicago and Tampa Bay are teams that I could totally see reaching out about him. Uh, but who knows if the Rangers will be willing to move uh, a contract that they've got locked next year. You said John Daniels has been dealing with criticism on Twitter for weeks? For weeks? At least, at least this week. Uh, I, I oh, would actually years. say oh, probably for years. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, oh, there's no question. I, I just feel like he's an easy target. You know what I mean? Because he's the – right, because he's the one face that's stuck around through everything, yeah. right? Through the first rebuild, through – the 2010 success through the 67 win campaign in 2014 to the playoffs rebirths and now the second rebuild, right? He's the one thing about the Rangers aside from Elvis Andrews who has been around the whole time. So I feel like he's kind of a punching bag because nobody can punch on Elvis. (laughs) Or previously, I think some people are starting to do that right now, but uh, Uh, whatever, when you're, you know, and again, it feels like every game is such a lengthy time. It feels like every game – I don't know about you, but it just feels like the losing streak, even though it was just – I mean, it was eight games, which is kind of lengthy. I mean, for 162-game season, it's not too much. But, man, I just feel like weeks and weeks when it was just eight days. Right. Right. Now, honestly, just for me, like, I, I miss baseball. The lockdown that – I'll just take anything that I can get. 
Uh, and I think that I think that there have been some Rangers fans who felt that way for the first couple of weeks. Definitely for the first <laughs> series. Exciting. Uh, it was just so good to have it back. And I think that there are plenty of Rangers fans who got cynical pretty quick. Um, even though they, they worked their way back above 500, I think once things soured last week, they pretty much turned. <laughs> There is one thing I wanted to go back as far as the Lance Lynn, and I think you could compare that a little bit to Mike Miner last year is, and this may be one of the reasons why you may listen a little bit more on Lance Lynn, because again, you, you, anything can happen next year. So if you hang right. on to Lynn and next year, some, something happens, I'm not saying, I mean, by, uh, by how Lance is doing, there's no, there's no record of that's going to anything downwards going to happen but it is always a possibility so i think maybe you listen a little bit more in regards to lance lynn because you may be able to get a lot back but right i i i kind of see where you know you hang on to him and see what you could build around as far as the rotation goes right so i think it's a risk reward um i think whichever one you choose and it doesn't work out there's going to be some major criticism and right. that's what, that's why the GMs get paid the big bucks to make those right. decisions. We, right. we just criticize when they get it wrong, but they're the ones right. that make the decisions. And that's where I, I know it's not going to Levi. I wouldn't want to be a GM right. because every decision you make is in a microscope and everybody remembers when you get it wrong, but hardly anybody remembers when you get it right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. And as far as Lynn goes, uh, something I just thought about is I think that Daniel should approach him and ask him candidly, what do you want to do, right? This is a guy who's been traded at the deadline before, twice, in fact, in one season. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. Um, actually, no, he wasn't. He was traded in the off season in 2017 and then flipped at the deadline to right. New York. That's what it was. Uh, even still that, that's two trades in a year. So this is a guy who's gone through this before. Um, nothing's going to shock him. If I'm John Daniels, I approach Lance and just say, what do you want to do? Right. Do you want to pitch for a contender? Do you want to ring? He's already got one. The Rangers know that too. Well, I remember when he was coming out of the Cardinals bullpen in 2011, I was like, dang, who is this guy? This guy is frustratingly good. Um, but but uh, he's already got a ring. Um, maybe some kind of stability, knowing where he's going to pitch next year, is something that's attractive to him. And I think that bodes well for the Rangers. The other thing I think bodes really well for him is he is the unquestioned leader of the pitching staff. I mean, there there is no question that those young arms that you know Julio Rangel, the pitching coach, uh, Chris Woodward the one guy that they trust above anybody else is Lynn for sure. So if that's attractive to him, I think that, you know, he, he might pitch John Daniels. Hey, I want to stay. Uh, I don't want to be moved at the deadline. I could certainly see a situation like that playing out, but I, I hope that John Daniels will have a conversation with him over these next seven days and, and lay some kind of groundwork related to that. Yeah. And, and remember guys, when a lot of times trade deadline one oh one when they're listening they're just listening. There's no deals right. that are being made. They're just rumors. Uh, I always think of it as like high school trade deadline. People want to spread around rumors that aren't true. So it's, it's, it's our high school's come a little late this year, but uh, it's coming. Right. Right. I don't miss high school. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't like the high school trade deadline rumors. I don't like that aspect of high school. Let me just put it that way. I agree with you. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What do you think is going to be, because you can look at this in a couple ways. And again, who knows what's going to happen tonight with Kyle Gibson on the mound, but with Oakland, with the Dodgers, everybody's saying that this is just going to be a full down homestand. Right. Do you think that maybe that's going to give this team a little motivation and maybe they can pull out a, I don't know if you pull out a winning homestand, but maybe a three and four homestand, a four and three homestands. You think that's in the realm of possibility? Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's, it, I would say it's certainly possible. I don't think it's plausible. Um, 
I don't think it's likely, certainly. Uh, but I think if you're the Rangers, you have to walk away from this hand, home stand with two wins at the minimum. Uh, you got one. You can check that off. I think you can check out the next time. It's, it's turning into a joke at this point. But I think you can check out the next time that Lance Lynn is pitching, that you, you are more than likely going to walk away with the win in that game. I think they've got to find some way to win a third game. And if they win a fourth, like you mentioned, this home stand is a gift-wrapped present. Um, they, they might be able to surprise somebody. Um, you know, maybe get to an Oakland pitcher in the back of the rotation, even though the A's really don't have a weak spot in their rotation with so many good young arms. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm not going to say that that's likely at this point, uh, but I think if you can surprise the Dodgers, maybe one of those getaway games, uh, maybe in the last game of the Oakland series, maybe in, on the Sunday game head-to-head against the Dodgers, if you can somehow grab a third and fourth win, that would be huge for this team moving forward. Because we saw how big the sweep was, right, right, against the Eagles at home. That was huge. Uh, that put them on a – that charted a course for them to get back to 500. That was that was basically a season saver. You yeah. could even say that early in the season. Um, I know from memory they got Mania going tonight. I forgot yeah. who's going on Wednesday. And on Thursday, I believe they got Bassett going yeah, on Thursday. Is it A.J. Puck tomorrow? I think I, I think so. Uh, and then I remember watching Bassett on Saturday against the Angels. Early on, he struggled, but then got into a groove. And then for the Dodgers, like I said, Lynn goes on Saturday, scheduled to go against Los Angeles. So we'll see how that goes. And, of course, starting up September, you've got 10 games against Houston. You've got a home series against the A's, a road series against the Angels and Mariners, and two games against Arizona. So we'll kind of see how that goes. Right. But um, by the way, wait. it's a it's it's a guy that they just absolutely love around here. Here, referring to where I'm located in Houston, Mike oh, Fires. Mike Fires is going again for the uh, <laughs> for the A's tomorrow. Yeah, he is a he is a fan favorite here in Houston. <laughs> so I'm trying to think. I think that means because the A's go to Houston this week. Uh, this upcoming weekend that means that they'll miss fires again i believe oh my god the second what? time for by one day if fires had gone tonight done it again. that's the second time that fires either pitches on the last day and will miss the houston astros i think uh i i was saying this to levi i think bob melvin is thinking that a little too much through I think you're probably right. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't think it's fair to say like either way, whether that was intentional or not. Uh, I, you know, I think it bodes better for, for the A's honestly, because the last thing you'd want is for Houston to get a chance to have some poetic justice, right. And really come out swing, come out extremely aggressive, come out really motivated and to embarrass you. Um, so I, and you know, the national, anti-Astros crowd would not appreciate that either. Uh, so I, I, I hope for their sake that that's not necessarily intentional. The Astros did win today, by the way. I'm checking out the score. They're in a doubleheader with the Angels and losing right now. Um, but, yeah, their, their season's been interesting as well, seeing the way that the AOS is playing out. It's crazy because the Rangers' victory yesterday was their first win. And, again, Major MLB.com has this weird thing where they calculate – what is your record against teams over 500, but they go huh. based on now, which doesn't make any sense. So yeah, when strange. the Rangers played the Rockies, the Rockies were 500 or better, but that right. doesn't count now because Colorado is under 500. Yeah. And that's weird. I don't know why, yeah, but that is true. if you go by MLB.com's logic, only one team is winless against teams over 500. That's the Rangers. No, they got their first the one Astros? yesterday. That's the Astros. They're wow. 0 and 8. Wow, that's interesting. That's really interesting. I'm looking at that stat that you have right now. Uh, Oakland's in first place. They are 3 and 0. Right, and the only Houston. three were that sweep right. against Houston. Right. That's crazy. That's really interesting. That's why I don't necessarily care for that because it doesn't really paint the picture. So, like when they played the Giants this year, the Rangers did San Francisco. San Francisco was like a game over 500 on the last game of that series. Right. And now, and now they're, they're sprinting. Oh yeah. They're sprinting now. But like two weeks ago, they were down at the bottom. So that's That's where it's like, 
playing a team like the Padres early in the season, right? You probably capitalize on that, but because when right. Padres before they met the Rangers, they were on a five game losing streak. So right. I feel like there's a lot more sprinting losing streaks this year. Five right. games, six games, or, eight games. Right. Or a team like the Marlins that's one game above 500 right now. Like, come on, how long is that going to last? I'm, I, I'm not trying to dig on the Marlins. In, in fact, if they, if they wound up in the playoffs this year, that would be a great story. But, uh, you know, I don't think it lasts all the way through the regular season, right? So uh, that, that stat is immediately questionable. Well, and then you also have to look at the way it's uh, structured. So, like, for instance, um, Cleveland would actually be in the seventh seed and Houston would be in the sixth because of second place, even though even though Cleveland is, I guess, winning percentage-wise, better than Houston is because you kind of right. have first place gets the one, two, three, second place gets four, five, six, and then you have, in this case, Cleveland and Toronto being seven and eight where – Baltimore is still only a half game back of a playoff spot. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's such a strange year, but honestly, the playoffs as they stand right now would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Right. Just, and, and you throw in the little wrinkle of the top scenes getting to pick who they want to play. Like that's going to be great. Just think about like whoever gets to pick the Astros. Right. If the A's end up picking the Astros <laughs> or something of that nature, uh, that would be, that would be unbelievable to see like the way that the storylines would develop. But in, in the the NL is really what's catching my eye because you have a lot of fun playoff teams in the mix right now, right? The Cubs have been a great story. They have played some really good baseball this year. Their run differential is a little questionable, but overall they've been really strong. Uh, St. Louis overcoming a COVID outbreak. They're two games above 500. They would be in the playoffs. Uh, Cincinnati, Milwaukee were teams that were touted as World Series contenders coming in. They are out of the playoff picture. Miami is in the playoffs, as you mentioned. And then the most fun team in baseball. And I say we can say this as Rangers fans now that last week is behind us. The Padres are the most fun team in yeah. baseball. I would love to see them in the playoffs. I feel like in my time – I honestly, in my time as a baseball fan for a better part of a decade, never seen them in the playoffs. I would love to see them in the playoffs. So I'm really liking the way that things are shaking up in the, in the NL. The AL is pretty much as expected. Right. And I think it's interesting because when I was doing like the first inning research for the Rangers, because you would think before yesterday, seven runs scored over the course of the entire season in the first inning. And you're talking about 27 games. That's pretty abysmal. But right. one team has scored one team as in the Milwaukee Brewers coming into yesterday. Do you know how many runs they scored the first inning this year? Uh, Ten. Two. Wow. That is unbelievable. Two runs in the first inning. Think about that. Well, I think Christian Yelich struggling out of the gate. He's somebody they always bat at the top of their lineup. That probably had a ton to do with that. Uh, he's oh, yeah. Kind of, he's kind of turned it around. Um, they're obviously not getting what they expected out of him for sure. But, um, but yeah, that, that, that absolutely is an eye-popping stat. Yeah. Uh. Baseball down the stretch. I, I, it's so weird that you're getting down to the final month, and then you just feel like, yeah. It's such, a, like, weird yeah. It's such <laughs> a weird game, and this is the strangest season I've ever experienced personally. I think everybody has that same opinion, whether you've been right. in the game for one year, three years, five years, 50 years. It's You know, I think, I think the only people that would say otherwise are those who experienced the game during the 1918 pandemic or during right. World War One and Two. Uh, but even then, like, you know, minor league players played, right? Those who were deferred played. You still had stars playing. You still had 160-game regular seasons. Or, you know, they weren't 162 games back then, but they were still a full calendar year. Uh, there's been nothing like this before in the MLB's history. So it's just the strangest season ever. You, I always say this. You can always uh, go in and tell your kids, your grandkids about, remember that in 2020 – the 60 game baseball season it's gonna be so strange remember when they played basketball and hockey in august remember that remember they played it all in one location in a yeah. bubble that's crazy that's crazy i'm enjoying it though honestly like i i was so deprived and i, I know you were i know every sports fan was just for so many months just like dying to come home and put something on the tv that wasn't a replay uh and then just 
all at once. We get it all back, and it's been so much fun. I think especially for Dallas fans being able to witness as far as the Mavericks go, the stars go, um, you know, with hopefully NFL seasons upcoming and, you know, we'll hopefully see what happens with the Cowboys. And then of course, big 12 football is still scheduled. Thank goodness. Um, Thank goodness, man. We'll see. Right. Uh, and then I'm not quite sure what the status is on high school football as of right Actually, now. Actually, you, you, you picked the right guy because I cover high school sports for Sports Talk 790 News. So, so class, what is the status on high school football? <laughs> class 5A and 6A are getting going in September. The smaller classes have the permission to play right now. And then there's some smaller class schools playing volleyball right now. So it really just depends on how big your school is. Okay. I think – so you'd say probably the smaller schools – would you say the smaller schools are probably more likely to get going than the larger ones? Definitely. Definitely. Okay, there, so the smaller there districts. Several, right. In, not in Texas. There have been several small schools that have already started playing football in Indiana, Nebraska, um, several other states around the country who have decided to just go ahead and move on. And I'm just, I'm just so thankful for that. It's just it, – it's, it's good to see some kind of sport starting normally and uh you hope and pray for their sake that they can do things safely obviously because that's the priority but i'm just so glad to see that we're moving in a positive direction as a country to where stuff like that can unfold over time i think if you ease into normalcy things will get you know you don't want to jump right into it but if you can just ease back into it and uh i do hope that you mr garrett is staying safe because I know you are in the Houston area um, with everything that. going on. Uh, so that, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully uh, you won't have to evacuate and yeah. everything will be all just a distant memory. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's, this is a, uh... This is not the first hurricane that this area has experienced before. It will not be the last. It is my first hurricane ever experiencing it, but honestly, I feel adequately prepared. and uh, So no worries here, but I appreciate the kind words. Well, I think if you've survived the last five months, six months, it's almost like a, it's almost like a hurricane. Okay. It's just like in, in 2020, it's just going to throw another thing. Throw everything but the kitchen sink at you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wouldn't be surprised if kitchen sinks start getting thrown too, but whatever. Yep, we still we still have four months left. We still have right. four months until Christmas. Right, right. <laughs> well, Garrett Jones, thank you so much for joining. If you want to see more of Garrett, uh, you can follow him on Twitter at GJonesOnAir and especially follow him for Dallas Stars coverage because with the way the team is playing, you don't want to miss it. It was a fun series against the Colorado Avalanche. Well, fun series if you're a Dallas Stars fan. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah, and there's still, there's still a lot of hockey left to be played too. We, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves uh, because the Stars have been here before, right? They got to the second round of Game 7, two of the last three seasons – or sorry, three of the last five seasons. Uh, so they've been at this point before. Um, it's just the way that things look right now, the trajectory, the way that they're playing right now, some Stars fans are starting to think ahead a little bit. And, you know, I, I encourage them to tap the brakes to avoid heartbreak, as we know, if you're a Rangers fan, you know how to do that. If you're a um, Dallas fan. If you're a Dallas fan, you know how to do that, unless you watch the Cowboys in the 90s, uh, pretty much, or the Mavs in 2011. Uh, but but pretty much you know how to tap the brakes otherwise. But, yeah, certainly it's exciting. You can find us uh, on Twitter, Dallas underscore Fanatic. Um, we're streaming live reactions before most of the game, and uh, if not after. So be sure to check us out. Western Conference looks fun in the NHL because you've got Dallas, Colorado, Vegas, and Vancouver. Yep. yep. Yeah, those are some fun teams there. Good stories all the way around. Seriously, whoever goes to the Stanley Cup – uh, out of those teams is going to be a fun one to talk about. And then also on the other side, I believe you have Boston, Tampa Bay, the Islanders, and mm-hmm. the fourth one's off the top of my head. The, the Flyers. There, that's what I was thinking. Well, yeah. the Flyers. Yeah. They're the number one team in the East, though. A lot of people don't know that. They, they, played, re- they played really, really well around February and March, and then the world shut down. So they, they picked up where they left off. But no, NHL postseason looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, yep, follow uh, 
Garrett Jones for more Dallas Stars. Uh, you can follow me at aplinktx for all your Texas Rangers news. Uh, I tried to make things a little fun during this time. Uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, you can follow some not as fun coverage, or maybe it'll be fun trade deadline coverage, but at dallasportsfanatic.com slash Texas Rangers. And uh, by next week, we will see what happens at the trade deadline. So uh, Rangers Nation, keep going for Rangers Nation that is in the Houston area or all throughout the country. Stay safe.